So the sermon today is covering three chapters um, of Acts, the book of Acts. Uh, I don't think in my 18 years preaching I've ever preached a sermon consisting of three contiguous chapters. Um, but we're going to be looking at, I'm not going to read them all, so you're not going to have to um, stand up and listen to me read three chapters, but um, we are going to kind of do a survey of them. Um, and um, there are, the reason I'm doing it this way is John and I have talked and, and it's challenging because we see kind of the same recurring theme happening in say the end of 22 maybe but 23 24 25 26 it's the same kind of thing happening in these chapters uh, to summarize it we see um, we we kind of witness the apostle paul while in captivity accused of very various crimes primarily by the jews and then um, defending himself and then sort of always being found not worthy of death, the crimes not worthy of death, and then being sent up to somebody higher. And we see, I'll, I'll kind of summarize in chapters 24, 25, and 26, that happens three times. So we first see him in chapter 24. Um, going before Felix, the governor Felix, one of the Roman governors in that region um, based out of Caesarea. Uh, so Paul is brought, well, even before this, he goes before the council. He's arrested, brought before the council, the Jewish leadership. They can't convict him of any crimes in a Roman territory so they bring him to the Roman authorities so he's he's before the council they accuse him he makes his case he goes before Felix the governor at Caesarea and then he goes before Festus and then King Agrippa all the way and we don't actually see him go before Caesar in Rome but that's on that's where he was destined to go so we see again the, this recurring thing. This, um, and I'll, I'll just give you if you're taking notes, you don't have to. But if you're taking notes, and I don't have them up on the screen because it's kind of not very easy to follow. Uh, from chapter 24, verse 1 through 9, is the Tertullus, the lawyer uh, for the Jewish leadership. The religious leaders, the elders uh, and high priests hire this or bring in this Tertullus who is kind of a lawyer making the case against Paul. And he tells the Felix all the charges that they're bringing against Paul. And he says in verse 5, he brings up four specific charges. And one was this man is a plague. He stirs up riots, he's a ringleader, and he profaned the temple. So those are the four serious charges within the Jewish experience, culture. But the Romans really don't care about a lot of these things. They care about the riots, but they don't care what happens within, you know, if Paul is, you know, challenging the Jewish ways. You know, the Romans don't really care about that. They want to keep order in the city and maintain law. So 24, 1 through 9 is kind of the charges brought against Paul before Felix. 10 through 21 is Paul's defense. We see Paul making his defense. Um, verse 12, they did not find me disputing with anyone, stirring up a crowd. Verse 14, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything they laid down, having a hope in God. Verse 18, they found me purified in the temple without any crowd or tumult. And, and it goes on. And, and he's defending himself against those charges. And then uh, Paul is, you know, Felix 
just like all of them say, well, I don't see anything worthy of, of death in this man. Let's put him back in prison. So they put him back in prison, and it's, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do here, uh, I'll summarize a little bit more about the charges and defense, and then I'm going to kind of zero in on three key verses. But first, the, uh, the next accusation is before Festus. Felix, his time is done. We'll get back to him. His time is done. He probably goes back to Rome, and Governor Festus comes in, his replacement. Prior to Felix was Pontius Pilate. So he had the position prior to Felix. Then Felix, now Festus comes in. Now they make the charges against Paul to Festus in verse 25, say one through seven. And then Paul, in his own defense, makes his case from verses eight through 12. Then he goes from Festus to King Agrippa. And the charges are made against him, verse, chapter 25, verses 15, all the way to 27. And then Paul's defense in 26, chapter 26, four through almost all the way to 30. So you see a recurring theme over and over again, right? The charges, uh, the defense, and the escalation, the, the, the sending it up to the next tier of the, 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 the system. And if it was like us, you know, I might get arrested in Northboro for something. I'd go to uh, maybe Westboro District Court or Marlboro District Court. I'd appeal it, go to Massachusetts Supreme, Superior Court, maybe. And then they, they say, I, I don't see. So, so I go to the, uh, uh, the, the appellate court, United States Appellate Court. If they don't want to do anything, I might go to the Supreme Court. So there's levels of legal, you know, um, there, there are legal levels which Paul in this Roman government is working his way up to the highest authority. Because if he can get the highest authority to say he's not guilty, then he, he, he is just simply not guilty. Um, but in these three chapters, 24, 25, 26, there are three little nuggets Three little verses that I'm going to focus on today. Um, again, we're not reading all these chapters because that would take up the whole time. But um, I want to highlight these three verses. The first one, and these, these three verses are sort of three things that Paul says that seem to be of the utmost importance to him. These are the three things that, is prob that are probably fueling his ministry, his missionary work. And the first one is chapter 24, verse 16. It says, so I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. He knows that when he stands before either the judge of man, like Caesar, or one of the governors, or the great judge, the almighty God, that he will, he knows that he'll be found blameless. He says, I always take pains to have a clear conscience toward both God and man. Now, he's not saying that he's sinless. And this is something we have to see about Paul himself and the biblical characters that we know and ourselves. I don't even know if we can say we have a clear conscience toward both God and man, but if we want to, it doesn't mean that we have to become perfect. It means that when a sin happens, when we're found to have sinned or we choose to sin or we fall into sin or we're deceived into sin, whatever, it means we, we confess it, we repent of it. We go before the Lord and we say, Lord, this happened. I'm putting it out here. I'm judging myself so you don't judge me. I'm, I'm putting it at the foot of the cross. Um, and same thing with between... Paul or between us and man. If I offend you, we have to reconcile it. I'll pick on Mish because um, I offend her the most. And, but 
it's like if I if I did, I would say, Mish, you know, I'm sorry. I was just not feeling good that day, and I, I, I just I, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have done that. Will you forgive me? And so I'd have a clear conscience. I, I, I we got it out in the open. Um, so he has he he takes pains to have a clear conscience. He confesses his sins. He makes things right with people he might have had a, an issue with. Everything he knows about himself, God knows about him. And can we say that? Are we, are we, trying, are we trying to hide certain things from God? You know, saying, oh, you know, I, he doesn't know the inner thoughts that I have. But if you can confess everything to the Lord, if you can just tell him all your inner thoughts, if he knows everything that you know, you can probably have a clear conscience. There's nothing hidden between him and God and nothing unreconciled between him and man. So Paul can say he takes pains to have a clear conscience towards both God and man. It's a good thing for us to, to just notice um, because when you do have a clear conscience, then people can accuse you and you say, I got nothing to worry about. If you have things hidden, and I'm going to get to this a little bit later uh, about uh, Satan. If you have things hidden, Satan will bring them out. And sin, never mind Satan, sin itself always seems to find its way to the surface. So if there's any hidden sin in you, it may take weeks, months, or years, but it'll always come to the surface. So get rid of it. Deal with it. Confess it to the Lord. Repent of it. Do battle with it. <clears throat> and then you'll have a clear conscience towards both God and man. So Paul can stand before any court and say, I am what I am. I am who I am. I have nothing to hide. None of your accusations can harm me because I have a clear conscience toward both God and man. He said that in his first defense uh, to, to Felix. And then Felix um, kind of, I think he kind of liked Paul. He, he kind of was maybe fascinated by him. And verse 24 in chapter 24 says, After some days Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, and he sent for Paul and heard him speak about faith in Christ Jesus. And as he, Paul, reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I'll summon you. Summon you. I thought, isn't that interesting what Paul chose to talk to Felix about? Those three things, righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. What if we, I mean, he is in a fight for his life now, right? In, in, in these trials. He could get the death penalty. So everything he says has to be worth saying. He's no small talk here. So, like, oh, like Festus, how long did it take to get from, you know, Jerusalem to Caesarea? You know, none of that. Every word is, is valuable and well thought out. And when, when um, Felix, I'm sorry, Felix, when Felix came and wanted to talk to him about faith in Christ, these are the three things he brought up. Righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. So we're going to look at each one of those, each one of those three things uh, briefly here. He, he brought up righteousness. And I wonder if he would have, I mean, he wrote, Paul wrote the book of Romans. And Romans 3.10 says, for there is none righteous, no, not one. And that comes from, um, oh, from Psalm 14. So he's going to tell Felix, he says, they're none righteous. You are not righteous. You, you're, you're in charge. You have power. You've ascended well from being a slave up to being governor. Um, you've done well. But how are you doing on righteousness? Because righteousness is that which, by which God judges everyone. If you're not righteous, you're out. You're not acceptable to God. You're not welcomed by God. So we have a we all have a big righteousness problem. 
Any sin just wipes out any righteousness. Any, however small, sin wipes out righteousness. And Felix knows himself. And if you read the history of Felix, his background, his bi biography or whatever, you'll see that he was not a good man. He had problems. He, he, he was a sinful man. And he did not have any kind of righteousness. So Paul telling him this, it's probably starting to get to him. And we see, you know, right there, it says he was alarmed and said, go away for the present. So Paul brings up this need for righteousness. And Paul might have talked about justification. That Jesus Christ is the one who, by whom we get righteousness. He would have said, I no doubt he would have said that. We don't see this here. But he reasoned about righteousness. And justification is the means by which righteousness is applied to or um, appropriated to us. So it was convicting to Felix. And Paul then talked about um, self-control. Felix, again, if you read his history, he had no self-control. I mean, um, he did what he wanted and um, with no regard to, to um, what was right or what was wrong, uh, he had no self-control. Um, and Paul, again, who wrote the letter to Titus in um, chapter 2, verse, one of my favorite verses, chapter 2, 11 through um, 14. Um, oh my goodness, where is it? It says, um, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. It's Titus 2.12. Training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. So Paul is saying that we have to practice self-control, not in order to please God, but as a result of his righteousness being applied to us, now we enter into this ability, this, this freedom to, to practice, to exercise self-control. We also see that in, uh, let's see, there's references to that in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 9, chapter, verse 25, uh, Galatians 5 23 which says that it is actually a um, the fruit of the spirit let's see if I can read that you all know it um, Galatians 5 22 23 but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control against the, these things there is no law so he's saying the need for self-control and then the coming judgment Romans 14, verse, um, what did I have? Romans 14, 10. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or, or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. This is something that the, the modern church doesn't talk about too much. The coming judgment. The one day on that that day, the Bible refers to it sometimes as the day. On the day, God, the great God, the creator, the great judge, is going to come and judge the world. Everything is going to be judged. Are we ready for it? If you are in Christ, you will be when he looks at us to judge us, he'll see purity, cleanliness, righteousness. And we will be judged guiltless. But if you're not in Christ, the judgment is coming. The judgment is coming for each one of us. And there will be a judgment of guilt 
and there'll be no appeal. Um, let's see, second, let's see, um, that's first Corinthians, I think I, um, I gave you the, those verses I gave you earlier were for judgment. Um, no, I was right. Um, but there are many, uh, Passages that talk about the judgment all the way from the Old Testament into the New Testament, all the way to Revelation, that tells us that judgment is coming, that we need to be ready. And I bet these three things that Paul talked about to Felix, I bet they were the things that cut right into Felix's soul. Because the Spirit was leading Paul on what to say. And Paul reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment. Those things were the, probably the things that Felix, were the things that Felix needed to hear the most. But when Felix was confronted with these things, what did he do? This is the sad part. He said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. At the same time, he hoped that money would be given to him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. When he was pressed, he was fascinated by Paul. He was fascinated by what he was saying and this, this message of, of grace through Jesus Christ. And he was exposed to the gospel. But when Felix heard the purest form of the gospel by the apostle Paul himself, he seemingly rejected it. He didn't receive it. And he left, he talked to Paul often, but there's no evidence that he received, that he repented of his sins and received Christ. And then he was gone and went to Rome, probably never again to have an opportunity. So Paul witnessed to him, he testified to him, he shared Felix's greatest need. Felix was interested and fascinated by it, but it didn't change him. And then Festus comes in takes over. We see the accusations again. We see Paul's defense of himself. We see, then we see Agrippa come in, Paul's defense of himself there. And then we're moving to the last of the three passages I want to bring up is chapter 26, verse 23. 22 and 23. To this day I have, this is Paul speaking, to this day I have had the help that comes from God, and so I stand here testifying both the small and great, saying nothing but what the prophets and Moses said would come to pass, that the Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light both to our people and to the Gentiles. This is the thing that caused, that, that, um, for which Paul was arrested. These, this is the thing for which Paul is on trial. All these things here. Christ must suffer that by, by being the first to rise from the dead, right? He said earlier, I think uh, John talked about it two weeks ago, um, people were fine with Paul until he talked about the resurrection of Christ and the Gentiles being part of it or, open, or welcome to it. Then everyone started getting upset and beating him and attacking him. But this is what, this is the core of what Paul is doing. It's a core message that he has. The Christ suffered, was the first to rise from the dead, so you have the resurrection, and proclaiming light to both our people and to the Gentiles. And I look back at um, John 3, Right after John 3.16, I think it's John 3.19. Ah, I should have had a marker there. John 3.19 says, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. 
So Jesus comes. He brings light to, to Jews, the Gentiles, to anyone who will receive it. He brings the light. Now, so those are the three kind of jewels that are hidden in these three chapters. That Paul has a clear conscience between God and man. That those three things, righteousness, self-control, and the coming judgment, are three of the core issues that everybody really has to deal with in some context or another. You know, as Paul didn't say, Felix, you know, Jesus loves you. He wants you to, he wants you to come and receive him. No, he said, you've got to deal with your righteousness problem. You've got to deal with your self-control. You've got to deal with the coming judgment. And then, then you can administer the, the love of Christ once people see their need for it. And then this last one, where Christ must suffer, and that by being the first to rise, rise, rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to both our people and to the Gentiles. Those three nuggets were the, were the core things that uh, fueled Paul's ministry. Now, just before I close, I just want to kind of make an observation um, of some things that we see in these chapters, some truths that we see, some biblical principles that we can apply uh, to these chapters. One thing, Paul is not by himself. He, he, he's alone. None of his other co-workers are in prison or before the, the governors or kings like him. He is there alone, but he is not. Uh, the Lord is with him. And when you feel alone, the Lord is with you. And these are the things we have to remember. The Lord will never leave you. Um, and when Paul is being asked and being tried with these charges, um, how does he respond? And I bet he probably heard what Luke wrote in Luke chapter 12. He says, um, and when they bring you before the synagogues and the rulers and the authorities, do not be anxious about what you should defend your, about how you should defend yourself or what you should say. For the Holy Spirit will teach you in that very hour what you ought to say. That, that's something that's applied to Paul now, right? How does Paul know what to say? The Holy Spirit is giving him the words. He gave him that word about righteousness, self-control, the coming judgment to, to Felix. And now he's telling King Agrippa these things about Christ. And as you read down, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, in short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? And Paul said, whether short or long, I would to, to, I would to God that not only you, but all, all those who hear me this day might become such as I, except for the, these chains. So he's telling the core gospel to these people. And the Holy Spirit is giving, giving him those words. One other principle comes from Isaiah 54, 17. Isaiah 54, 17. It says, um, oh, I don't have any of these marks. Uh, it says that no weapon formed against you will prosper, right? No weapon formed against us will prosper. 54, 17. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed and you shall refute every tongue that arises against you in judgment. So Paul, you know, th these weapons that are formed against him, that are fashioned against him, they're not weapons of swords and cannons or arrows or anything like that. They're false accusations. They're lies. There's some beatings, right? There's imprisonment. Those are kind of weapons that the enemy is using to silence Paul, to shut him up, to get rid of this way, the way that he's promoting this Christianity. But none of those will prosper. They're all going to fall short. And God's plan will continue to be played out. And then just now I'm really going to start closing, but um, I thought how this is kind of a almost a real life metaphor for life in general. You know, we have 
they, how many times, we've seen three times in these three chapters, the accusers accusing Paul of all these bogus crimes. Each one has maybe an element of truth that you could maybe make a case for, but they're bogus crimes. Don't we have an accuser? Well, let me, I won't ask you the question. I'll say we have an accuser also who is bringing up, bringing us up on crimes before God. And our accuser is telling God all the things that we have done. He's telling God, Steve did this, Steve did that. Steve is this kind of person. Steve has this in his heart. He's, he's a plague to you, Lord. He stirs up riots among the people of Rice Memorial. Uh, he's a ringleader of, of the people called Christians. Satan, with his bony white finger, is pointing at me, saying, he is not worthy to be in heaven. And what can I say? Because what he's saying is true, right? So when, I'm, when the three of us are there at the judgment seat, you have the judge, you have me, and you have the, the accuser, the prosecutor. What, what have I to hope? What have you to hope on? I hope you, you're dying to yell out, Jesus Christ! Because that's our hope. When we stand before the judgment seat and Satan is saying, look at all these things he's done. He deserves death. And then the doors open. And Jesus comes in. He says, ah, oh, wait. He's mine. His debt has been paid. His crimes have been paid for. He gave me his crimes, and I gave him my righteousness. And then what does Satan say? He just shrugs his shoulders. I got nothing. We that, see how precious it is to be in Christ because we are criminals. We are rebels. You know, we are, have done great crimes against God and his kingdom. But thanks to Jesus Christ, when we receive Jesus Christ, he takes our sins, he gives us back his righteousness, a double blessing there, right? Takes away our sins, cleanses us, gives us his righteousness, justifying us. It's that propitiation is the, the, the accurate term for that. He makes, he atones for our sins and gives us his righteousness. Two elements to propitiation. And that's kind of what we see happening here with, with Paul. Now, Paul eventually does die, according to history, tradition. He was beheaded in Rome by Nero. The Bible doesn't say that, but that's what extra-biblical historians say. So at some time, you know, God said, okay, your job is done. That's it. You're coming, you're coming home. But... While Paul was doing his job, the Lord was working all things and allowing him. The Holy Spirit was giving him words to say. The Lord said no weapon for, fashioned against him or against us will prosper. God's plan will be carried out. And we see, again, um, the, the things that are happening sort of applied to us in the spiritual realm. Um, and just as Paul knows that Jesus Christ is with him, we know that Jesus Christ is with us and that we will not be um, uh, condemned to everlasting separation from God, uh, but we will be with him forever in paradise. Um, so then at the end of chapter 26, Paul finishes his talk with Agrippa and then Agrippa sends him off to Rome. He, again, he, 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 the accusations, the defense, and the escalation. 
and now he's off to Rome. And John's going to pick that up next, next Sunday uh, in chapter 27. I'm not sure how far that'll get, but we're coming towards the end. We're going to try to possibly finish uh, Acts before Easter um, and then start um, a couple messages on Easter and then maybe a topical series uh, for a while after that. So give thanks to, to God that he is on our side. That he, um, he protects us. He has made us righteous. Um, and that we're all set for the coming judgment. That we have no fear. Not because we're any good, but because we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And for that, we are thankful. So let us have a moment of prayer here. And then we'll sing another song. Let's pray.